to uh, welcome to the stage now uh, Arno, who is going to be uh, talking to us today about augmented API design uh, as a reviewer. Um, so uh, let's bring him onto stage. Here he is. Hi, Hello. how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Very good, very good. Well, we'll uh, we'll crack straight on because we don't have too much time here. So okay. I'd like to ask you to present your uh, your slides for today. Yeah, there are. Oh, it already looks good. I'm looking forward to this one. Okay, I'll leave you to it. Thank you. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, I'm Arnaud Loret, the author of the Design of Web APIs. You may also know me as the API handyman. I'm a senior API architect at Natixis, a French group providing banking and financial services. And my job is basically helping IT and business people understand and create APIs. Helping people to create APIs implies reviewing API designs. API design review is a vast topic covering many aspects from pure design concerns to cross team governance and everything in between. If you want to learn more about this overall topic, you should look at my API design reviewer starter set talk that you can find on my blog. Today, we'll focus on my journey to what I call the augmented API design reviewer, which aims to make reviews more efficient, safer, and simpler. I tell you why and how I automate part of APIs and reviews using the Open API specification and Spectral YAML and JSON linter. When people want to create a new API or modify an existing one, its design must be reviewed. To do a review, I meet the API team, they explain me what they want to do, have a send me their design, analyze it in depth, we discuss my feedback, the fix for design, and if needed, we cycle. An API design review has three purposes. First, ensuring that the identified needs are the real ones and ensuring that the design actually fulfills them. Second, ensuring that the design offers a good developer experience that uh, it is easy to understand and easy to use. Third and last purpose, ensuring that the design has the same look and feel as all of our other APIs and so making our APIs even more easy to use. And this is done by checking the design conforms to our API design guidelines. That sounds like a good plan. So what the problem? Checking conformance to guidelines means checking that each property name is in lower common case, checking that schema names does not end with technical suffix such as DTO, checking resource path structure, tracking non evolvable strings, among dozens of other checks. Checking conformance of a small new API or small modification is done easily in a matter of minutes. But when there are uh, dozens of uh, when there are dozens of evolutions to check, uh, minutes becomes hour, and there is a significant risk of oversight because I'm just an average human being with a limited amount of concentration. And things can get even worse when working on a huge APIs. Uh, hours can become days. And the question is not, will there be oversight when checking guidelines confirmance, but how many? The problem with APIs and reviews is succeeding to spend the less possible times on guidelines, conformance, done checks, and avoid oversight, while spending as much time as possible on tasks actually requiring a human brain, like working on needs and developer experience. And how do we do that? by augmenting API design reviewers. Hopefully, we don't have to become machines or cyborgs to be faster and more accurate API design reviewers. All that is needed is a machine-readable description of APIs and a linter. So forget wiki pages and other spreadsheets. Use the open API specification to describe your APIs. The open API specification, formerly known as the Swagger specification, is a standard and programming language agnostic REST API description format. An open API document can be either in JSON or in YAML format. It describes API resource path, operations, response bodies, and any other thing you need. To describe data, the open API specification relies on JSON schema, which allows to tell, for example, that the user object is composed of a mandatory ID, first name, and last name properties, and also has an optional address property, which type is defined by another JSON schema. Now that we have a machine-readable description of an API, we can analyze it with a linter. 
Instead of reinventing the wheel, I used Applied Spectrum, which is an open source linter that can analyze data such as OpenAPI documents, async API documents, Kubernetes configuration files, or any other JSON or YAML document. Linting an OpenAPI file with Spectral command line interface or CLI is quite simple. Open a terminal and type Spectral, lint, followed by the OpenAPI file name. Spectral is able to detect some problems right out of the box without providing any other information than the API description file. For each problem, you get its location, its level, the rule that detects the problem, and a human-friendly description of the problem. Spectral comes with a pretty fine set of rules specifically made to analyze open API documents. Obviously, your guidelines are probably not the same as the ones bundled in Spectral. And hopefully, you can design your own rules in order to check that an API design conforms to your guidelines. A spectral rule set is a YAML file, and it contains a rules property. And inside rules, each rule is identified by a name. A basic rule is composed of three elements. The first one is the given property, which is a JSON path indicating where in the document this rule will be applied. The current value targets the ID property of any reusable schema. The second one, the then property, describes the controls to be done. Here, the control is applied on a field type inside the element found by the given JSON path. It consists in checking the field type value belongs to an enumeration with a single value string. Enumeration is not the only available function. Spectral obviously comes with some others. And last but not least, property of a basic spectral rule, the description that tells humans what happens. This rule checks if the ID property of any reusable schema is of type string. Let's roll spectrum again uh, with our rule set. It tells us that on line 28 of OpenAPI file, an ID is not of type string. Indeed, the reusable user schema has an ID of type integer instead of string. As you can see, uh, using Spectral looks quite simple, but let's not talk about the real world beyond the hello world. Let's talk about how actually build and then use Spectral rule sets that will help you to secure and speed up your reviews. It would take a day long workshop to describe all the functions, tips and tricks I use to build Spectral rule sets. As I don't have a day for this session, I will focus on the two most important matters that may not obviously come to our mind when using such tools. I will focus on how to design rule sets and how to be sure that they actually work. But still, while talking about these two topics, I may incidentally share some tips, but without going deep into details. Just like an API, a uh, spectral rule sets actually needs to be designed. You, you should not start from scratch and, and write random rules one after another. You need to think and you need to have a plan. If you don't already have API design guidelines, write them, at least a minimal version that you will expand when needed. Look at my load of API design talk to uh, learn more about that. Once that's done, you can start to express your guidelines as spectral rules. But do not rush blindly. Just like when you represent jobs to be done as a REST APIs, you have to think twice. You must ensure that your rule design is actually relevant, user-friendly, and maintainable. To do so, you obviously have to think about rule names and descriptions, but choosing adapted rule granularity, rule severity, and organization is even more essential. Let's talk about granularity first. If our guidelines tell that all responses are objects and not strings or array, for example, and get slash whatever slash uh, plural name always returns a list of results. And this list is represented as an object containing a required property named items, which is an array containing the list of results. And each item in this list must be an object and not string or numbers. And when the response is a list, the return object may contain a page property that must provide the current page number and total number of pages. To check all that with spectral, we could create a single rule named valid collection schema telling that a list response must conform to our guidelines with a long but explicit description of what is expected. It would target schema of 200 responses of get operation on paths ending by a plural noun, 
thanks to some magic regex filter. And eventually, in the then clause, we could use the schema functions that checks a data structure conforms to a given JSON schema. And so provided the JSON schema of the expected JSON schema of the response. What happens if we run spectral with a rule set containing this rule on this open API file having a get slash users returning an array of users? Spectral detects a problem. But what is the problem exactly? Is there a mistake on pagination data or is it something else like items which are not objects? Customizing the message to add problems path and error message may give us more clue about the problem. Okay, so user schema is missing a property name properties. That's not really useful, unless you are an expert of your guidelines, your spectral rules, JSON schema, and the open API specification. This rule is definitely too coarse grain. Let's see what happened with multiple smaller rules checking individual aspects of these guidelines. That's better. We know exactly what the problem is Thanks to fine-grained rules, we know what, that the response should be an object and blah, blah, blah. In my example, we only have seen warnings, but as uh, spectral rules uh, can have uh, different severities, uh, you can use that to get um, a better vision of the different problems. And here's how I use them. Error. That's an actual error. It must be fixed without any discussion, like um, a 204 node content returning data. Warning, it looks like an error, but it can be normal. Fix it if needed. For example, a post request body without any required property is not normal most of the time, but it can be sometimes. Info, possible improvement. For example, hey, what about adding pagination or what about adding search filters on get slash whatever slash per name, which returns a list. Hint, that's an element that needs to be discussed by API design reviewer and the API team. For example, the use of content type other than application slash JSON that may require specific design and implementation because files certain go through our API gateway. That way, and especially using the hint level, I know where I have to focus my investigations and discussions. And finally, in order to be user-friendly, but most important, be maintainable, you have to organize your rules in various rule sets, just like you would organize functions in various libraries. Currently, I have around 70 rules organized in 10 different rule sets. Rules are organized based on what they test. Each rule set can be used individually. For example, if I just want to check security aspects, like uh, those each operation is covered by at least one of two scope, I obviously use my security rule set. And if I want to use all my rule set, I use a main rule set that includes all the other ones, thanks to the extends property, which is uh, which takes a list of paths to other local or remote rule sets. As you can see again, hand with many rule sets containing many rules, some of them being quite simple, but some of them being terribly complex, especially the one with the JSON schema. But how to be sure that all of this actually work? By doing tests as usual. And here's a summary of the various test strategy I use along my learning path. At the very beginning, I had a single rule set. I created a single uh, test of an API file to check that all my rules were actually working. Um, as the number of rules grew, uh, it quickly became a nightmare. It was really hard to add new use cases into the test of an API file and manually check spectral output to be sure that all expected errors were there. Splitting my rule set into smaller ones was not only dictated by the need of just organizing rules, it was also done in order to simplify testing. But even after that, uh, splitting my rule sets and my open API and test file into smaller ones, it was still painful to add new test case in the individual open API files and manually check the results. Hopefully, Spectral is also available as an RGS library. Therefore, I created mocha unit test suites and used the Spectral library in them. I created one test file for each rule set, still using an open API uh, file for each one. But now I was programmatically checking that I get the expected problems. And that was better. I even realized that some of my rules were actually not working at all. But 
Even if it was better, using a single open API test file for each rule set and testing all rules of the rule set at once was too complex and prone to errors. That's why I got a level deeper in my testing strategy. I decided to test each rule in isolation with a dedicated input for each one. Uh, to do that, I tinkered with the results of the spectral parser to only keep a specific rule active and deactivate all of the rules when running a test. I also managed to be able to use partial open API documents instead of complete ones, uh, making writing tests easier. As the number of rules and rule set was growing, I was fearing to forget testing some of them. So I added checks to ensure that I have a test switch for each rule set. And at the end of uh, each uh, test suite, I check that each rule has been used at least once. It's not perfect, obviously, but it works so far. As my testing became more and more accurate, I realized that some rules were not working because the JSON path in my given clothes were wrong. They were totally missing their targets, making, missing some of their targets, or eating the wrong targets. So I got another level deeper. And instead of testing each rule as a whole, I did dedicated tests for the given clause to ensure that they actually eat what is expected and do not eat wrong targets. To do those tests, I tinkered again inside the result of Spectral Parser to get the given JSON path. Then I use the JSON path plus node library, which is used by Spectral under the hood, and I use this library on some JSON inputs to check that what is returned by each JSON path is what is expected. The level of uh, given close testing depends on the JSON path complexity. If there are no filters, I just check that I get what I expect on a simple example. But if there are filters, like regex filters, I do specific checks for each one. I check that I get what is expected, but also that I don't get what is supposed to be ignored. And uh, that really uh, solves many of the problems I have with uh, JSON uh, path. After all these evolutions, uh, writing tests for my rule and rule sets became quite simple. The test suite names uh, tell my spectral wrapper which rule set to load. The sub-level test suite name tells the wrapper which rule will be tested. Each test is composed of four checks based on fragments of open API documents. I check that the given expression actually finds something. I check that the given expression actually ignores specific elements. I check that the rule actually returns an error when we did and does not return an error when needed. And I do a final check consisting in verifying that all rules have been tested. I have no more than uh, 400 tests to check around 70 uh, rules, and, and that makes me confident. And so I don't need to double check what has been checked by my spectral rules. And I can also design new rules very quickly. So let's sum up what we have seen about the design of spectral rules. Create your guidelines in first place. Ensure user friendliness and maintainability by designing your rules, choosing adaptive granularity and severity, and organizing them in various rule sets. And do not forget to test your rules like you would test code. Once you have a minimum rule set, start to use it immediately. Do not wait to cover your whole guidelines. Using Spectral in your design and review process as soon as possible will help you to improve your rules and Spectral skills. It may also give you a few ideas about how to use Spectral in your review process. This happened to me, and now use Spectral in three different ways. When I receive an API contract for review, I use the CLI to do a quick check and see how many problems there are. If I need to quickly go through uh, all problems and jump from one problem source to another, I open the, the file in Stoplight Studio. It's a GUI with both OpenAPI and Spectral support. I also use it when designing APIs, but that's another story. To make my rules available in Studio, I just need to add a .spectral.yaml file in the project and then reference my main rule set directly target, targeting the Git repository. And so the problems list show the problems detected by my rule set. And I just have to click on each problem to directly go to its source. But all this only works uh, when there are not so many problems. 
if there are hundreds of errors, and that happens when I do a full review of a very old API that was existing before we started to do API governance, uh, the output of the CLI and the rendering in Studio is not really usable. I need to get stats to know what are the different uh, categories of program in order to make a summarized review that will be the input for uh, a design workshop. Hopefully, the CLI can output the result as JSON. I pipe that into JQ, a command line JSON processor that allows to do crazy stuff like transforming spectral JSON output into a CSV file that I get import into a good old spreadsheet. Uh, if you want to learn more about JQ, uh, check my blog. There is a post series about it. Once the CSV data is imported in the spreadsheet, I can easily sort and filter results and get some stats. This session was quite intense, and all this was only a brief summary of how I use Spectral. I did it now on all of my reviews. It really helped me to make more accurate, exhaustive, consistent, and faster review. And this is only the beginning. I'm starting to provide my rule sets to API designers, and I have many other ideas around this tool. So what should you retain from this session? Using a machine readable API description and an API description later will give excellent results when reviewing and designing APIs. But you need to work on your rule set design and testing to actually get those excellent results. Obviously, a linter cannot fully replace human being when reviewing an API design. It will not tell you if the design is accurate to fulfill some needs, but it will save you time to actually focus on that. It will save your time by making guidelines conformance check faster and reduce oversight. And it will give you an overview of the stylistic quality of an API. And it will even give you some hints about things that should be discussed with the API team. Thank you very much. I was, uh, a lot of information there. I was trying to scribble some things down as you were talking, but I realized it's, it's too much information. Um, I, I popped a link to your book in the chat as well. So anyone who wants a little bit more detailed information can go and get that book from Amazon. Um, uh, we, we have one question in the chat. I'll, I'll just repeat it back here. It's, uh, what is the advantage of using Spectral? Does Swagger Hub provide the functionality of using standard and custom rules? Uh, I didn't knew that uh, Swagger Hub was providing uh, an equivalent services. Uh, I don't know. Uh, all that I can say is that um, Spectra is highly customable. Uh, I, I didn't show it here, but you can write JavaScript to create really complex rules. So maybe Swagger Hub can do that too. Uh, it is it, it easily integrable in anything because it is available as um, not just library. And Spectral is open source. I don't know if the Swagger Hub uh, linter is open source. So as always, uh, I think what is important here is the principles behind uh, before the tools. Uh, it's really important to lint your contract to check conformance. No matter what tool you use, uh, you really have to, do, to design your rules to make them user friendly and check that they actually work and choose the tool according to your context. And uh, if you're happy with Swagger Hub and, and they do everything that I show you, hey, use it. Yeah, yeah, it's good to have the choice at the end of the day. And Philip uh, confirmed that you can script in Spectral, but not in Swagger Hub, but okay. you can do reg regex in, in both, okay. Um, yeah, so that was good. Just just one last thing. You mentioned Lord of API Designs. Is that another book or? or no, you know, it, uh, it's, it was my, 2018 talk. Uh, so uh, you can go to my blog. Uh, there is uh, the, the video and the uh, and the slides. It was a talk okay. about uh, what are API design guidelines and how to build them. Okay. Okay. So that's the the API handyman.io, I guess. Yeah, maybe exactly. maybe just pop a link to that in the in the chat, and then yeah. then we can follow up. Hey, fantastic! Really enjoyed that. Thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, take much. care.